welcome to episode five of Tales from the Gig. I am Colin. And I'm Kevin, again. We are coming to you live from Rebel Base Studios here in beautiful Enola, Pennsylvania. Kevin, how was your week, buddy? How were your gigs? Oh, not too bad. I just had one uh, Friday night with Andy Alonzo and friends out at the Bluebird, Car- Bluebird Cafe. No, what is it? Bluebird Inn. Get that right one way or another. Bluebird anyway, Cafe's in Nashville. One of those little corners, <laughs> small little places again, you know, with a bar and all. But um, people dug it. That's all that matters. And, uh, yeah, it was just a trio. Uh, guitar. Well, Andy played guitar and bass. And um, I just did a little kick snare hat and a little floor type of thing. And Beth Trez on piano and keys, and she played left hand bass. So, um, Sweet. <laughs> thing of the night we had uh you know the song call me by blondie yep we did it as a bossa nova nice <laughs> <laughs> and then uh andy starts this uh song oh everybody knows come together by the beatles mm-hmm. but he started uh he used the bass line from inner city blues by marvin gay yeah, yeah yeah and then uh we put come together on top of that so. that's cool <laughs> Just uh, some cool things. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I know you did some of that. We haven't done that together too much right. yet. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I love, it's so much fun doing that it type is. of stuff. Yeah, you know? it's a lot of fun. And people are like, what the hell is <laughs> Wait that? a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Oh, so, yeah. yeah um, you had a nice trip down to Atlanta. <laughs> I did not have any gigs. No, I have tales from fucking Georgia. <laughs> yeah, I had to go down to get the registration renewed on my car and got stuck in, uh, anybody watching or listening from Atlanta, I got stuck in the ice storm saturday and uh the first two emissions places i went to um that was the whole reason i had to drive down was the emissions were out on the car so oh, i had to go down just to get that done so i can get my pennsylvania tags and everything finally and the first two inspection places i went to closed for weather and then the third guy was closing as we pulled up and i basically begged him to stay open oh just to inspect the car i explained to him i'd driven you know 13 hours just to get there just to get the 15 minute inspection done and he was cool enough to stay open wow so I got that and got the tags, and then I was planning on staying in Georgia for the day, but the the storm literally chased me up 85 until I hit Virginia. It was so every you just t- turned right back around. Turned just... right back around. I was in Georgia two and a half hours. <laughs> was, oh man, that was a rough. That was the quickest turnaround I've done that trip. So no gigs, but uh, yeah, I was I was planning on going out to Maxwell's to see the Wayback Band. My buddy Murray Dabby, uh-huh. um, who we've been talking to about getting on an episode, um, his cover band was playing at the Cigar Bar Saturday night. I was hoping to go out to that, but that crazy weather. Um, and then from what I heard, by six o'clock, it had all melted off. Oh, no so, <laughs> but yeah, it got it got pretty uh, rambunctious. I had my son with me and. We, we almost got stuck a couple times. <laughs> it was because, again, Georgia folk know they don't treat the roads. They don't have plow trucks. Yeah, they're or, not used no. to that down there, yeah. And heading up 85 around, 
I guess it was two or three o'clock in the afternoon, there was just a, a legion of plow trucks and salt trucks coming south from, I guess, Virginia or North Carolina to help oh, wow. out. Because they were calling, I checked the weather Saturday morning, they were calling for a dusting. And um, in the 45 minutes it took me to get from the state line to my son's mom's house, um, about three and a half inches had dropped, wow. which is a lot for Georgia. I mean, it's a lot yeah. anywhere yeah. if you're not yeah. expecting it, but it's a, a, a once every you know five or ten year snowstorm in Georgia. Mm-hmm. But it was it was good, Connor. Got to see snow and... Um, any, uh, I got the car inspected. Interesting uh, music listening to, yes. discoveries, whatever. Yeah, right? I have rediscovered or discovered a love for the Bare Naked Ladies. It was... <laughs> I, I've um, always loved Bare Naked Ladies. Well, yeah, of course. But <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, of course I listened to them back in the 90s, you know, and they, they came up on, I had my musical comedy station playing on Pandora, and f- for a reason they came up, because I guess they're kind of tongue-in-cheek, mm-hmm. and uh, just great songwriting like yeah. I, I was listening to this stuff I was like jesus like i remember these songs when i was a teenager you know but i didn't really listen to mm-hmm. listen to the songs and i'm like i wish i could write songs this good like right. the lyrics are phenomenal the music is perfect like they just killed it so i ended yeah. up when I, mean, I was in the car 26 hours over or th- over a 36 hour period oh. and i listened to i think just about every one of their records i was and then that took me back to they might be giants who i haven't listened to in years mm-hmm really cool quirky songwriting and that was my takeaway for the weekend so i at least had that going for me mm-hmm. so yeah i left friday afternoon at four and i got home sunday morning at 1 a.m so oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> slept in the car <laughs> friday night so yeah it was that's a trooper there yeah right? yeah a, so that yeah that's so that was crazy. good times well actually i drove back from Cal- uh, um, colorado this past summer and it's a 24-hour trip if you go mm. straight through. Yeah. But I drove, I forget, I, I slept four hours in the car. Uh, yeah. And well, that's whenever I go. If I'm by myself, I never get a hotel room. Yeah. I just can't justify spending the money. Yeah. So I get in the passenger seat and lay it back and I always bring a pillow and a blanket mm-hmm. and I always try to find, me. I've noticed, this is for all you vagabonds and gypsies out there, the, the welcome center the cops don't come to because there's no exit in their state before it. So if you sleep at the Welcome Center, they won't hassle you because you're not <laughs> supposed to stay overnight. Because my last trip down, I stopped at a, one in the middle of Virginia, and I wasn't there five minutes before a trooper was knocking on my window really? telling me I couldn't sleep there. So apparently they'd rather you drive tired than sleep for a couple hours. That does, uh, it's that's called fine. a rest area. you think they'd be cool with it, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just looked like a hobo or what the problem was. But Is that more of a southern thing? Maybe. Really? I don't know. I mean, that was, that was the middle of Virginia. It just adds to the things I dislike about Virginia. But... <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, but yeah, I've, I've so usually I'll, yeah. I'll try to get to the North Carolina Welcome Center, or the South Carolina Welcome Center, and, and, and camp out for the night, so that's what I did. I made it all the way to South Carolina, so I thought I was doing well, but then the weather took a turn, yeah. so. It's good to know. Yeah. That welcome yeah. Center. So, so there you go, gypsies and vagabonds, for <laughs> and probably us when we go on tour. That's <laughs> like the old uh, Road Warrior uh, rule, you know, you don't. When you need gas, you don't get off at this unless you can see the sign. Exactly. Yeah, there is none of this gas next mile and a half off the yeah, ten miles that down bullshit. It. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> but uh, the Oscars were this week, and um, I did not tune in, but I had heard story of uh, Billie Eilish uh, performing yesterday for the in memoriam segment. Yeah, and, that's um, that's pretty much all I really heard of the uh, of the Oscars. I mean, yeah, she uh, that gives us a chance though to talk about her music and what more what her and her brother are doing to the industry and. To me, it's a good thing. So if anybody's watching, I didn't mean that to sound as ominous as it did. Mm-hmm. But uh, I had watched a documentary or a, I don't know what you'd call it, I guess an interview on, on YouTube with her brother, Phineas, who's her producer. He he produces all of her music, as far as I know, um, with like a, it said studio tour. And I, I love watching that stuff on YouTube, gear rundowns yeah. and studio tours and stuff like Drool that. So like, I didn't know who <laughs> Phineas was when I saw it. Yeah. So I was like, all right, let's click on it and i I had heard the name Billie Eilish. I have a fifteen year old daughter, so yeah. you know. Um, but as we've said a million times, we're not big pop guys. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I didn't really know at a passing knowledge, I guess, but his his studio tour was his bedroom at his parents' house. And I'm thinking like, all right, well who is this guy? And I start looking and he and his sister won like seven Grammys a few weeks ago right. and all of the music was produced in this bedroom there's in that video showing her the, the big the single off that record her recording the vocal sitting cross-legged holding what looked like a like a neumann like a tlm 103 in her uh-huh. hand singing into it <laughs> and him producing the rest um 
and it's it's a sign of the times, really. Yeah, I, mean, I love it. The uh, it, it a it's lot. it's if this podcast had a subtitle for me, it's the democrati- democratization of music. Yeah, I love that more people are able to make music that's mm-hmm. indistinguishable from stuff that's made in studios. Right. Um, I've always had a project studio since I was 16. You know, I've always had something in my house to record. Um, and there's so many outlets now. Anyone who owns a Mac or an iPhone, you have GarageBand. You have a fully capable studio right in your phone. Right in your phone. Yeah. Um, uh, just you can do amazing things you can do with it, not to do the back in my day, but our old four track Tascam tape recorders, we couldn't dream of doing the shit that we can do now with an app, right. free app on our phone. It's just. Yeah. It's, I remember in high school, I mean, friends of mine, the guitar player and bass player, uh, went in and bought a little four track, yep. brought it over, and went, yeah. it was like, wow. It was. <laughs> You mean we can record multi-track yeah. and you flip it over flip and bounce it, it down? Yes. Yep. And then I remember my buddy Peter and I, who was in my first band with, mowed lawns for like three summers and bought our first digital recorder. It was a Tascam, um, the one that recorded to zip disks, which is a dead fucking technology. If you yeah. know, I've got a <laughs> safe full of zip disks I know, upstairs. I know, I got a bunch of them too. Yeah. I still have some of the drives. All the, the, big, all the masters of our the, recordings. The big scuzzy connectors. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> no USB then. But that yeah. thing... Good God, that thing had to have been two grand. We yeah. say, we say for years to buy that, but it was it was lossless bouncing, mm-hmm. so we could record a hundred tracks and it sounded like we recorded them all live. Mm-hmm. And I remember the first thing we recorded was Hotel California. All we went and bought the sheet music because it mm-hmm. had all like seven guitar parts, <laughs> and we sat. I mean, we were like fourteen, so it took a while, but uh-huh. tracked them all out, and that was so cool. And you look now, and literally a free app that most people don't even realize is on right. their phone or is available does light years past what that stuff did yep. and i think these the billy eilish record that won all these grammys is the culmination so far of that mm-hmm. there's been a lot of these like diy groups that have gotten really successful jack white's a great example yeah record you company know, yeah yeah and they this is like one step further you know it's recorded in a bedroom mm-hmm. literally in a bedroom there's no when you see this tour there it's not like oh it's in our home studio you right. know and it's a hundred thousand dollar studio in the basement of their right. house right like i mean it's you can see he's like doing his homework here and he's making platinum records here <laughs> like and it's the first right on, you know yeah i mean we, we, you've heard uh like edm guys like skrillex and guys like that do it in the can you mm-hmm. know but it's all on a macbook right. this is performed instruments which i think is really cool the yeah. drums are synthed a lot of the music is synth but he's doing piano he's miking his little he's got a little stand-up piano in there he's got a mic in and she's recording her vocal sitting there on the bed and you can hear it in the music it sounds, it sounds intimate it, it's yeah. real it, 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 it's very um is it raw thing yeah well too? not even raw you're you're you feel like you're you're almost voyeuristic. I don't know how else to explain that. It's kind of hard to explain that, like, for audio, but it's like you're not supposed to be hearing it. It's very, very personal. Uh-huh. Um, and yesterday I was sitting with my daughter, and we were going through Billie Eilish videos, and I'm listening, to it, and that's what I took from that. I'm like, man, this is almost uh, voyeuristic. That's the the uh-huh. best word I can think of to use for it. But her lyrics fit with that. It's very. It fits the music. It's that vibe, you know, that we we keep talking about, and it's. It, it, it almost, I mean, it, it's not for me. It's for 15 and 16 year olds, you right, know? So yeah. it, it felt a little strange in that, but like you're listening to it, it's like, man, this is like, you found some tapes that nobody intended for you to hear, you know? And that's not saying the sound quality is bad. The, right. the production quality is phenomenal. Like the guy's got a really good ear, but it's very personal feeling. And it's, I think it's cool. And they write the songs. There's no ghost writers. It's the two of them. And she's like that's 17. That's like, what she's 17. How old's he? I, th- I think he's older, but not much. Not much I mean, maybe wow. a year or two. So the fact that these kids are doing that, and it's not these, like, canned pop singers, right. you know, that are, are, yeah, they're, yeah. they're I mean, it, it, it's not. It's, you know, we all it, have heard this. We know what goes on in Nashville. Yeah. They've got songwriter yep. houses. Exactly. Where yeah. that's all you go show up, and they write and write that's, and write, and then there's these, and it's a formula. Yep. Like, and, okay, for instance, if you works. like Taylor Swift, big surprise, you're an Ed Sheeran fan, because yeah. he's written... 80% of her music, yeah. you know, Brad Paisley. If you're a country fan for pop country in the last 20 years, guess what? You really like Brad Paisley because yeah. he wrote or played guitar that's on just so about every fun, yeah. country hit that's come out since 1990. I know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're kind of the new singer-songwriter. You know, that's, that's it, cool. we always think a singer-songwriter is, you know, acoustic guitar in a coffee house, uh-huh. but that's just not it anymore. You know, with with they're taking advantage of all these really cool – um, he showed in that video him sampling like noises around his room and making a drum beat with it, and it was like holy shit! Like yeah. that's so cool. Like it, it's just 
Guess, and yeah. Uh, if we had had those tools when we were that age, we would have done shit like that. Certainly. Like that, you know, we just didn't. You know, I had a shitty acoustic guitar with a cheap mic on yeah. it, you know, so that was what I used. But I remember trying to use the microphone on my turntable for oh, some yeah. stupid I, reason. I, my first guitar amp was a solid state Yamaha stereo receiver, you know, because it had a, a fourth inch input. So I'm like, uh-huh. well, guitars plug into that. <laughs> that's where it goes. <laughs> that's <laughs> yep. And yeah, I mean, what that's. What happens when I do this? You <laughs> use what you got. Yep. And these guys. Obviously, dude has an ear for it and has some really cool gear, but not super expensive. Like, right. he didn't have a wall full of analog scents. He even talked about, like, I don't have room for outboard gear. Plugins sound really good. And it's just proof. Like, you don't make good music and make it well. It doesn't really matter to a point what you're. Well, it's it like uh, we were talking to a, a future, future episode. <laughs> <laughs> um,. You know, it, it, it comes down to the song. Yep. If the song, the structure of a song, if you can sit there with a guitar and just a vocal, nothing else, and it's a good song and it sounds good and yep. feels good, everything you do after that is just adding on to it. Absolutely. It, it, it has to have a core like that. Yep, and you listen to some of the greatest recordings. Um, like some of my favorite Beatles stuff that George Martin did were those Yesterday and Let It Be, the stuff that's real intimate. Mm-hmm. Sergeant Pepper is amazing, of course. Of course you yeah. know, the stuff where he's bringing in full orchestras right. and doing all this on four track is incredible. But some of that stuff he did, he just knew, I'm just going to put a microphone here and I'm going to let Paul McCartney play piano and sing yep. and we're just going to record him doing that because this song is perfect. Blackbird, the drums are yep. slapping on legs and it's Paul McCartney. Spoiler alert, it's yeah. not John Lennon it's or John George Lennon. Harrison on that. Uh-huh. Paul McCartney playing acoustic guitar, uh-huh. and it's perfect. Like, you you could not make that recording better. It doesn't matter. You can go into Blackbird Studios in Nashville and record it, you know, with a $100,000 Martin on a $200,000, you know, rig. Yep. It's not going to sound better than that recording because it's the song and the performance of that song. I think about that, uh, that song um, by Soggy Bottom Boys. Oh, Man of Constant Sorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the movie, they show you, like, he, literally, they went in around a microphone. That's how they did it. Recorded it. Yep. Right then, like, one take, two if you were lucky. Oh, yeah. Most yeah. of it was one. Yep. And that was it. Absolutely. You if know? you if you watch the old Motown documentaries yeah, or the right. Wrecking Crew, that Wrecking, was you know, that, that was how they mixed, is how far, if you're louder, you're further away from the microphone. Yep. But it's, it's cool to see those old pictures where they, a lot of those guys had two track, you know, right. four track wasn't really a thing till the 70s, I think. Um, so, I mean, they have left and right. That's mm-hmm. that's what they're working with. So it was a microphone, and I think sometimes they would either have a second mic on the drums or a second mic for the singer, yep. usually the singer. Um, so the singer's off in this corner with his microphone, and then there's one microphone, and you've got, like, backup singer, backup singer, <laughs> yeah. stand-up bass, guitar, <laughs> guitar, drums are, like, 15 over feet there. over yeah. there. Yeah. And some of those pictures are so cool. You listen to those records, they're perfect. They sound like, great. Yeah, what yeah. are you going to do to improve on that? Exactly. Like, they didn't have stacks of outboard gear and the, the newest plugins, you know, and all, all this. It just wasn't a thing. And that's, I think that's really cool. Yeah. So um, we've been promoting a gig this week. Kevin. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, uh, I woke up this morning and uh, I had to, I was working on putting Colin's uh, first EP up on YouTube. Uh, by the way, anybody wants to go check that out. Rebel um, Base Adventures. And, yeah. Um, and as I'm doing that, I suddenly was like, oh, fuck. We have a gig in two weeks, which is our first full band our gig. Our first full band gig. Yeah. It's, yep. Which we were, fl- <laughs> we'll never rehearse for it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> because Joel's coming up from Atlanta. Yep, to on play Wednesday. The gig on Wednesday. Yep. The gig's on Friday. Yep. If anybody is listening, when do they get to No, they won't get to this. Yeah, they will. Yeah, this yeah, is coming out. That's this week. When, this Wednesday, yeah. <laughs> and we got so much things going on right now, it's hard <laughs> to keep it all straight, which is a good thing. But So for anyhow, those of you listening live, next week we have a gig. Yes. Yep. Next week we're in uh, Sunbury, Pennsylvania, a place called uh, Route 61 Roadhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll be a three, a three of us, and it's the Colin Al- Alvarez band. For now. We may have a band name by then, but We're, it's being billed currently as the Colin Alvarez band. Yeah, any any uh, band name suggestions? Yes. Throw them to us. Post you know? them on Facebook. Any, yeah, whatever. Text them to us. I suck at names. Yeah. So uh, we're looking for something that yes. sounds cool and everything. But anyhow, so I woke up and I was like, oh, fuck. And then I was like, you know, my brain kicks in. A, a type <laughs> A it starts going in. I was like, okay, we need this. We need to do that. We're going to do a poster. And poor Colin's at work. It's <laughs> <laughs> true. Oh, I was working. I was on somebody else's time. <laughs> yeah, so, and he's... <laughs> So I'm sending shit, and da, 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 da. so anyhow, ended up uh, you know a couple hours designed a poster, and and we'll stick it up here so you can see it. Yeah, and all. But, yeah, uh, we'll start collecting 
gig posters and have them hang in here in the studio yeah. and get a little ambiance. Uh, we're gonna start. I want to start collecting photos of guys we interview too, printing them out and getting yeah. them framed and, and everything. Once we're in our permanent studio again, this is Rebel Base Studios Part One. And, so. and the reason we bring this up really is, is like there's a lot of fucking work behind the scenes. People, that people don't realize. Just don't realize. Yeah, how much we work don't, goes into the four hours of performance or yeah, three hours. We don't of performance. hire a booking agent. Yeah. We don't hire a, a graphic designer. I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not a booking agent. And, so. and <laughs> I'm not really. A, I've done video work, but I'm not a like. A, I don't consider myself a professional video. Agri- right. It's just when you do this. You okay? I need to do this. How am I going to do that? Well, let's see. Okay, I'm YouTube will teach learn. us. Yeah, <laughs> YouTube this. Or, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Google is your friend in that sense. So, so we just figured out and get it done because, like, the poster I designed today, certainly, you know, you just paid two hours of labor at a graphic design house and yeah, cost you hundred bucks, three hundred fifty yeah, or so. At least, at yeah, least, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, it's not just throwing a blank piece of paper with some words either, because that makes you look like you're. Look like, like you did it paper. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes a good time. Now, admittedly, I go out. We we try not to reinvent the wheel and just find things and yeah, but steal it works. them in a sense. Yeah. You know, and make yeah. It the days own. of like we're playing at the sock hop Friday, you know, and that's yeah. the end of it. It's just that's not the case, people. Yeah. Like our job is PR. Our job is customer service. Our yep. job is everything but music music's music's our pay it's it's not the job <laughs> that's like, the fun part yeah really. we finally <laughs> get to play music after all this other shit that we do so that's you know that's our idea of this podcast we're having great conversations with people we want people to kind of see behind the scenes yeah. and see if anybody's been curious or musicians that are listening and watching can kind of commiserate because they they mm-hmm. have to do this all, all of us do this it's not kevin and i aren't special we're no, not no, different no. every band all do. Look, every I mean, band that works true is, we had to talk with Truett about it you know yep. he he uh, had some more people doing it, but then as he, you know, he started taking more of it back, yep. doing it himself. Tales and, from the Gig episode two, yeah, episode available two. now. Uh, <laughs> and that's just that's yeah. the way it is. You got to wear so many hats in this business, yep. uh, and I'm sure there's other businesses as well. But I mean, you know, the the uh, the fans and stuff they see you when you're at on the stage. Mm-hmm. That's and they think, they oh, they're musicians. It's like, and well, a yeah, ton of work to go. Yeah, absolutely, on that was being in the studio, try, deciding to produce my own record mm. on this one. It, the the hats uh, so many hats because yep. it was it was songwriting and then it wasn't songwriting anymore it was performance and then it was okay do I bring in my buddies or do I bring in the guys that are right for the song mm-hmm. and that was a whole thing and then getting the right performance but I'm also the engineer so making sure the mic's right and making right. sure the snare mic isn't touching <laughs> the rim and and then finally it's like oh shit that's right now I have to perform right, like, right. and then after that doing overdubs and while I'm listening being like oh shit I gotta make a note and ruining a take because I'm sitting there you know typing a note real quick on my phone mm. there's just so much that goes into what we do and and it's I love it I wouldn't change it for anything but yeah. if anybody's curious we'll we'll probably do an ep- a whole episode of, of, of that our next one of just yeah. Kevin and I talking we'll we'll do kind of a behind the curtain of, of what goes into just an average right. week or day or month into a, an indie band. Cause that's what we are. Well, we're, and that's we're, like we're, I was, we were saying about the gig next weekend and, and just in this type of situation, I mean, I know he's played gigs. I've played gigs. Joel's played gigs. So, and I, we all play these throw together gigs anyways. So there's a, there's a level of trust and, and we know we're going to be fine and all. However, you do everything you can to prepare for it. Yep, to make sure it goes fine and smooth. So, and you know, I'm going to yep. chart out the things that he's played live, so I at least have a roadmap. Because I've, you know, you and Joel have played together, so you pretty yep. much know each other. Yep. But yeah. I haven't. So. And then we won't follow any of that <laughs> yeah, when we actually exactly. do it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Right. But it at least makes me feel better going in. Yeah, whatever, yeah having, you know, but, having a, a safety blanket. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, uh, you know, we try to work out everything going in. You know, can we get there early? Can we do a sound check to get a little bit extra time? Can we set you know? up cameras and maybe get some video? Yeah. Yeah. Cause, when are we going to get up to Sunbury to drop posters off? And yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. That and goes we just into love it. to be doing too many fucking things at once. Yep. So we're gonna have a gig and we're trying to milk the hell out of it. Yep. Do every get every ounce of media from yep. it that we can. And since Joel's kind enough to fly in for the for the gig, that's where that's uh, it. we're. Gonna, I think we talked about recording all the tracks. For yep. the, you know, through my and, a, and, and a performance video soon on youtube yeah. featuring us so our first cover video that we're going to shoot that weekend so <laughs> fuck sleep just because we don't have enough just because do. we don't have enough to do <laughs> why would we take a saturday off and have like a barbecue and right. hang out when we can do a full video production oh man so, <laughs> we're, yeah, we're dumb is basically what we're getting at people 
insane, but, uh, yeah, certainly. Definitely I mean, crazy. We all joke about it. All musicians joke about it, yep. but it is true. You know, and at the end of the day, though, it is we love it. Yep, that's it. We just <laughs> hope it'll buy us food. <laughs> exactly. And um, that brings us to this week's guest. We had the great Max Levitan of the Night Howlers on. He uh, food brought us to Bax. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're all eating something, <laughs> and you'll Uh-oh. get to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ma- Max, I said last week John's interview was the most candid. I think Max has set the bar. Yeah. <laughs> to uh, we, uh, if you guys have been watching since the first episode. We have kind of a formula we follow when we're talking to people, and one of the things is asking for crazy gig story tales from the gig. And Max hit a home run this week. <laughs> He nailed it, uh, but it was a good talk out, yeah. outside of, of that oh, story. Oh, yeah, I thought he was very um, genuine. and I loved that he brought a new perspective in that That's it, yeah. he hasn't been playing since he was three. Yep. He's not born into it. He you know, came he, from a different type of uh, like Like experience. so many people. Yeah. He got into it in high school mm-hmm. and and was in, you know, high, he wasn't gigging when he was 15. You know, he... He played in his shitty high school bands. I don't know if they're shitty. They were probably good, but well. you know, yeah, he was playing in his with his buddies, you know, in basements and garages and house parties, and slowly started going out to jams. But it was it was cool hearing that side because everybody else we had talked to so far, it's very like I was born with a guitar in my hand or born yep. with drumsticks in my hand, mm-hmm. which is cool too. Everybody's got a story, but it, that was the first one of that brought totally in agree. to the podcast. It was and cool that. It, we found, you know, somebody had that yeah. different experience. Yeah, because yeah. It doesn't always happen the way we. No, yeah, you know, and that's do it. and and so many people I know started that way. Mm-hmm. You know, especially uh, hobby players, especially Max is a pro, um, but you see a lot of the guys that just start playing. They just get a guitar in high school because their buddies play guitar, right. or you know, they just happen to get one for Christmas, or their uncle had one that he passed down, or whatever. Um, so it's cool to hear that side of it that he's now parlayed it into a career that mm-hmm. he's playing music and and doing it for people and yeah. they just had a huge sold out show at Smith's in Atlanta which is a big venue, um, and I mean they sold out early yeah. I mean, it was you know a day or two before the show the, the the show was sold out so that's that's cool that's a big deal um, they, and he they, was upfront about you know they're they're just experimenting they're trying to figure they don't know what the fuck yeah they're doing. yeah no he was he was real real open about yeah, yeah that they're just. They're, they're they're spitballing. They're they're cool. just kind of shooting from the hip and and going after it. They're just guys that like to hang out and play music. And I personally think that there's nothing wrong with it. And sometimes those of us who came up through such a structured one, I can myself is included, is it's hard to get outside of that Very. box. Yep. You know, you know. I remember there's a quote. Um, I think Joseph Campbell or something something about it. you got to learn the skills of your trade mm. and then forget them. Yep, forget them, everything. <laughs> yeah, totally. And yeah, that's that's true because we all have trouble with that second part. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that idea of um, one of my teachers, my improv teacher, Kevin Carwile, um, who I've talked about before, uh, I remember gave me a, a, I don't know what you call it, a test or a skill or a, a, a task one day was like, all right, play a solo and it was just over like a 12 bar blues it was nothing crazy and i did just what i would normally do i'm sure it was a pentatonic you know something or other and he's like okay cool do that again but you don't get to play a root <laughs> and it was so like if we're in c i couldn't play a c no C's, yeah that was it was like oh shit like uh but i got actually the safe note <laughs> yeah exactly it's like well i gotta i gotta think now and then he would be like okay do it again but you can't play the third uh-huh. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my god! Like you just pulled my safety net out. Right, like that's right. yeah. I'm actually, and that's showing you like, hey asshole, think about what you're doing. Like like give a shit. You know, yeah, don't right. just right just look what I can do. And I still do that to myself sometimes. If we're playing these wallpaper gigs, like we're talking about, it, if if I'm playing with a rhythm player to where I can solo, uh-huh. I'll do that. I'll be like, man, we're playing Moon Dance. That's a pretty straight song. I'm gonna try to do it, and I'll do that. Like I'm gonna try to play this. Uh, and you can get a little more complicated as you become a more advanced player, but over a certain scale shape. Or I'll, I'll tell myself I'm not going to play any root, or I'm only going to play double stops. Uh-huh. You know, something like that, just to kind of expand your horizons. And I, I think that's cool. And that's Max kind of talk. That's kind of how they write, and that's how they perform. Is that they're very big on just figuring their shit out together. So I thought that was really cool. But yeah, yeah so episode five, that's Max awesome. Levitan. You guys enjoy the interview. <laughs> Alright everybody, welcome to episode 5 of Tales from the Gig. We are here with the great Max Levitan. Max, how you doing brother? 
I'm good, man. How about yourself? Good, good. How's yeah. how's uh how are things in sunny Atlanta, Georgia tonight? Uh, well, it's not super sunny, uh, right? But uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's been good. We just had a we had a big gig uh, at at Smith's this past weekend that went even better than I could have imagined. So been pretty high off that. Yeah, I was uh, I was following that on Facebook. For you guys that don't know Max or haven't looked into him before listening to the episode, he is the guitar player for the Night Howlers, uh, based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And you guys were at Smith's this past weekend, right? Yep, yep, Friday night. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, tell us about that gig real quick before we, we dig in, because it, it looked, uh, from the video, it looked, and I saw you said it was sold out. I mean, that's, that's a big deal to sell out Smith's. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so it, it was a lot of fun. You know, we've, we've done Smith's three times before, once in the downstairs and twice upstairs. And so um, the twice upstairs, one, we were an opener and then we were a, uh, a co-headliner. And we decided that we wanted to do it downstairs this time. One, because we were just lazy pieces of shit and didn't want to lug our gear. That load a nightmare. <laughs> right. But, yeah. but two, you know, they, they were given a better cut um, at, at, uh, doing it downstairs and, I, I guess we just didn't really expect to sell like hundreds of tickets. So it made sense. This really, really dope band called 87 nights from Charleston mm -hmm. came down and, and opened for us and they sold some tickets and come to find out we sold it and the capacity was a hundred. We sold it out um, the night before the gig, nice. and, which was really cool. But you know, I'd never experienced it before cause you know, we're new and this is very new to me. Right. You know, but I've never experienced waking up in the morning to a bunch of texts of people freaking out, like, what do we do? <laughs> yeah, you know, we told them, like, hey, just just show up. Like, I ended Right, up yeah, there'll them. be plenty of tickets. Just pay yeah. at the door. I called the booking guy, and he's like, look, man, we got to get you on the books for this summer. I'm like, hold on, one thing at a time. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm stoked we sold out, too. But, um, you know, what they did was they basically just eyeballed it. You know, there's fire code, so they're not going to, like, put in writing that, like, they'll oversell the show. But right, we right. Ended up, they ended up overselling it by 43 tickets. Um, nice. And so it was 143 sold, which was cool. And that's with, like, a lot of people actually bailing because they just assumed they, they weren't going to get in. Gotcha. So it was it was super cool. It was our first time playing, like, two full sets. Well, actually, yeah. no, we've done it at Maxwell's, but... Um, right. I, I guess at Smith's, we, you know, it was 120 minutes of playing with a set break. First time we were ever uh, yelled back for an encore, which was kind of neat. Nice, um, man. But it was a it was a really, really, really fun show. And, and people seem to genuinely be having a good time. So uh, I'm stoked on it. That's badass, man. Yeah, that's the video cool. I saw it sounded great. It looked like the crowd was super into it. And that's uh, that room. If when you get that room going, there's there's not a lot of rooms better than that in Atlanta. When when you get it full, it's it's bleak when it's empty, but when it's full, it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it <laughs> smells like the basement of the fraternity house I I, I, I used yeah. to live in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but there's a there's a bit of filth that I just appreciate that mm -hmm. for what it yeah. does something for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I was, I was really, uh, really about it. We, we had a lot of fun, actually made some money, which was kind of cool. Um, that's unheard of yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> musicians <laughs> making actual cash. Yeah. That's how it's yeah. supposed to be. Yeah. Don't yeah. ever, if you get the chance, don't ever look at that room in the daylight. If you get in there and they move those <laughs> curtains in the front, you'll never walk in there again without a tetanus shot. And a yeah. Blacklight it, dude. Yeah. So, man, that's awesome. That's that's a big show for you guys. That's very exciting. Um, so let's get a little background on you. When did you uh, when did you know you wanted to play guitar? When did you pick it up? What kind of inspired that? What got you into it? So, I it, it's it's weird. I I didn't like. I wasn't one of those kids who was just like, oh, man, just give me an instrument. Right. You know, it wasn't one of those things. It was my dad that encouraged me like, hey, man, you should play an instrument. And I'm glad he did. And yeah. I encourage everyone to force their kids to try music. <laughs> truly. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, he gave, you know, I got this acoustic guitar when I was 10 and I got some lessons and, you know, I learned some basic chord structures and you know, actually started off the right way reading music. I wish I stuck with that. Yep. Um, but I didn't and I still don't. <laughs> but um I I um I just wasn't into it, man. Um I, I, I started on this acoustic guitar and I just wasn't into it. 
I put it down. I stopped taking lessons. My dad wasn't going to pay for it if, um, if I wasn't practicing. And then I forgot how it happened, but I guess I had re-engaged some interest and I got an electric in my hand. Okay. And when I plugged it through like a little, like, I don't know, maybe like a line six, 10 watt amp or something, you right. know, oh, yeah. um, and I heard the distortion. Um, it, it did something for me. Um, you know, and so I guess I technically started playing when I was 10, but I never really been, uh, consistent enough over the years. Like I really wish I had dedicated a lot more time to building a stronger foundation when I was younger. Right. Um, but as far as like, did you want me to go into like the music itself, my influence or just how I got into playing the instrument? Either, either one, man. Yeah. yeah what? Whatever was most important to you, whatever, yeah. so, if it was an artist or if it was the guitar itself. Yeah. Just anything. So here's what's interesting. This either will surprise you or not surprise you at all. But, you know, I was one of those typical kids that had, had all of your generic, like, 90s interests like my dad tried to get me into like he would like try and play i don't know led zeppelin and and older stuff and it, for whatever reason it, it just wasn't hitting me and i'm listening to you know uh lincoln park and limp biscuit and oh yeah like uh, <laughs> and and metallica and you know which was that that was good at least but i, I just didn't really have um it just didn't really hit me and although i really um not to speak negative or positively about the man's character, but this particular musician is what my dad finally put on that kind of caught my attention and reeled me into a different direction. He mm -hmm. played Cat, Cat Scratch Fever by Ted Nugent. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, man, this one goes a little harder. Like, yeah. cause I like the heavier stuff. And from that, I started diving into some of his collection. He showed me um, Grand Funk Railroad yeah. and the Climax Blues Band. And from there, I started doing a lot of my own exploring. And that's when I discovered who today is still my favorite guitarist um, and probably forever will be um, is Joe Satriani. Nice. And so I started diving into the virtuosos a little bit at the same time while discovering Jimi Hendrix and Stevie Ray Vaughan. And, you know, that really kind of, that really kind of blew my mind. And, um, from there I started to dive into the, like the new blues realm mm -hmm. where I discovered Kenny Wayne Shepard and, um, really fell in love with him and Walter Trout and, you know, some of those guys, right, um, right. pretty young. And, um, you know, my first ever concert, I, I um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of proud of this one, but because of diving into that music through my dad, the first concert that I reached out to him and said, hey, I want to go see this was in 2004. I, I grew up about an hour outside New York City. So at the B.B. King Blues Club, I went to see Mountain, Leslie West in Mountain. All right. Nice. Yeah, nice. yeah, that's awesome. Fucking awesome, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I just really kind of got um, I really got sucked into it. And so, you know, I started asking my teachers to kind of show me some of the bluesy stuff. And, and that's where I think that's where I kind of started really like diving into like improv. I had this like Fender. It, it was like it came out like 15 years ago. I don't even know if they had, but it would like had 300 different preset backing tones yeah i know what you're talking about yeah uh, what was that um they had a twin reverb version of it it was called the cyber twin but they had like the little practice amp too that had like drum beats and all kinds of stuff built exactly. into it you yeah change the key it was when it came it was super cool yeah. yeah 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 when i learned like the basic like that basic primary shape of the pentatonic mm -hmm. out of the five the one everyone knows um I basically just started running up and down that scale through all those backing tracks. And that's kind of how I learned to put together different licks. And once I started to go there, that's when I really felt enveloped in, in it. Yeah. No, right. That's awesome. Hey, sometimes it's not the traditional way that you fall into these things. You know, <laughs> it didn't strike you at first. And for whatever reason, later in life, it did, you know? 
So yeah. It yeah, doesn't that's, matter. That's real similar to me, Max. I got my first guitar when I was nine, and I didn't really pick it up till I was probably 13. So it's the same kind of thing. You know, I, I bought one because I thought it would be cool. And, of course, because nobody in my family played guitar, I bought a nylon string Fender classical guitar. The neck was, you know, the width of like a 747 wingspan. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't get my nine-year-old hand around it. It sucked. I didn't have anything good to play. <laughs> so it sat in the corner of my bedroom for years until – I was into chicks and they wouldn't pay attention to me and it made me sad and I needed to have a, a way to like an yeah. outlet for that. But it was the same thing. How for... many musicians started that exactly. way? Yes. <laughs> Playing in bands. And yeah, mine was hearing that opening riff to Pride and Joy, like so many guys. And it was like, holy shit. Yeah, like, I don't that? know what that is, but I need yeah. to like, that's getting my palms sweaty and getting yeah. my heartbeat going. And that's, yeah, that's, that's. If, if we should rename this podcast to thanks dad because <laughs> literally everyone we've talked to it's their dad that's yeah. gotten them got them going so that's but uh but that's awesome man how old were you uh when was your first band like when was the first time you or you played with a group of guys not necessarily a band but played with other people so um when i was in high school i was i don't know 15 16 and um you know i i uh my my level of uh uh, high school athleticism was I was president of the guitar club. If that says <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, uh, did you let her I, in that? I was just, I didn't know, like, you know, I was just like jamming over jam tracks. And I, I met this kid. Um, I met this kid named Dustin Williams, who is now, um, the bassist, uh, with Truett. Okay. I was about to say that name's familiar and I was, I was gonna, I was trying to place it. Yeah. Yeah. Was, he was two grades below me, and then we met this other kid named Paul Lassiter. He was a drummer, and it was just the three of us, and we didn't have a clue what we were doing. Of course. And there was this the school schoolhouse rock thing that we were putting on, and so I, I came up with this name, and it was funny. We didn't even really play funk music, but I <laughs> I called it the the Freeform Funk Foundation, F to the four. Nice. Uh, and we just, I don't know, we just like put together these like improv jam things and we went on stage and we played it. Yeah. Um, it was super fun. We didn't have a clue what we were doing. But, you know, since then, all I ever did was like jam with some buddies in basements. Yeah. So I really consider this experience with the Night Howlers to be like my first real band. Yeah, experience. totally. Oh, right on. How did how did the Night Howlers come about? Were they established and you joined up? Did you co-found it? I don't really know the backstory of the band. Um, it was, I mean, I guess it was pretty serendipitous. Um, so I've known, I've known Alex, Jason and Andrew all, I guess about eight to 10 years. So okay. I don't think they'd mind me telling this, but so all four of us, <laughs> coincidentally, all four of us coincidentally have been sober for years. Oh, right on. And, all right. And I, I mean, I, I mean, I've been sober eight years and I've got the least amount of time in the band, which is kind of neat. Yeah. But it was, it was never intentional. Like, Oh, let's put together a sober band. Like right. I had nothing yeah, yeah. to do with that. Um, but you know, Jason and I, Jason and I got kind of got sober together and then me and Andrew kind of got sober together in a different group and Alex was already sober and he helped me and like, but we had all kind of grown up and become friends and Jason, you know, plays bass and we would just go down into my parents' basement every day, like 20, 21 years old, like blasting cigs and like jamming and improv in, in the basement. Right. And, um, you know, Andrew, you know, would, would kind of come up from Noonan where he lived and, and join us. But Alex, Alex has always said that he played drums and, you know, drummers don't just like pull out their drums from the car. They got their set set up somewhere. Right. <laughs> and he was one of those guys where he was just like, y you know, I play, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you mentioned that. He's like, you know, I'm actually not that bad. Like, very, <laughs> like, very, but like, very humbly. Like, he wasn't being, like, snarky about yeah, it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But, like, he made it seem like it was no big deal, but in that way where, you, like, you would hear it and you'd be like, he's probably really fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> and... I got asked to do this open mic thing for some fundraiser at Kennesaw, uh, which is where I went to school. And I was like, Jason, you want to just like grab our instruments and go do a thing? And he's like, look, dude, we've been playing you and me in the basement <laughs> for years. Why don't, why don't we grab a guitar, like another guitar player who like sings right. <laughs> and a drummer and like actually do a thing. And I was like, fine. So I reached out to, 
Andrew in. And I was like, Alex, you play drums. Do you want to, like, do a thing? So they came over, and we just were like, let's just do a few blues tunes. Yeah. And so we decided we were going to do uh, Thrill is Gone, Smokestack Lightning, and Cocaine. Nice. And um, as soon as we started playing, first of all, Alex turned out to be the most talented member of the band, the drummer. <laughs> There's no surprise there. Yeah, that's, that's funny how that works sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, Kevin's a drummer, if you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we went, we, we did it, and we had a lot of fun, and the, 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 the sound guy at this Kennesaw thing runs up, he goes, what are you guys called? What are you playing again? I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? We were just... <laughs> we're not a band what do you mean <laughs> yeah, yeah 20 of our friends came up to us and asked us the same thing and we we're like i don't know should we should we do this again and and we just tried it out and, and we just started we just started running through a bunch of covers and jamming out in the basement and it's kind of um it, it's kind of taken on a life a life of its own i mean it was really just like let's play for fun and now we're like i don't know headlining little gigs at smith's yeah I that's mean, there's a that's awesome, man. the the best yeah. The best bands don't feel like work. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, that's just, it happened organically. Yep. Yeah, and that's it, it. It. I've been in bands that were formed intentionally, and you can always tell. <laughs> it's yeah. It, it's that. No, that that's awesome, and and you you can tell you guys enjoy it. You know the videos that I've seen you post on Facebook, and and just the posts that I see you guys make about it. I, you can tell. There's no ulterior motive that you guys are doing it just for the joy of playing music. That's awesome. That's that's good to see. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, we're having a lot of fun doing it. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, the 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 kind of the shape has transformed a bit. You know, Andrew is really the creative driver behind it, right? And it's taught me a whole lot because yeah. for me, anytime there's sound, I in my the, the way I taught myself is you're just supposed to improv over it right (laughs) and i think what the band has really helped me learn is what am i serving am i really serving the song and so i'm learning a lot about when not to play Mm -hmm. or when to maybe just play a a, a strum something once instead of throw eight notes yeah yeah totally Uh, that's been a really neat journey and it's not like it's sort of my kind of music, but also not like I really delved into like, I'm a jam head dude. Like yeah. I travel around the country to see fish. I saw I'm that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm that guy. Who's yeah. Like, oh, Trey. <laughs> so it, it's funny. And we're playing like this, like the way I describe us is I say, think the black keys a little bit more jammed out and not as good. That's, that's <laughs> right on yeah that's, a, right. that's a, a good description yeah. but yeah that that phrase serve the song um comes up a lot with with people that we're talking yeah. to and that's that's always makes me happy to hear from guys when i talk because that's that's almost become like a bellwether for knowing if the person you're talking to is a, a musician or if they're just a player yeah. and and learning to serve the song is so uh, important well it, that's it's, sometimes space no notes silence or whatever you yeah. know just laying out is the right thing to do it feels makes whatever the song feel better you know yep. or leave instead of playing eight notes play two right yeah yeah and that, that that that's that. truly been the most challenging thing for me to learn yeah. but also the most helpful thing for yeah. me oh yeah to learn. Well, we it's, do drummers especially you get a lot of i was i've been there done that you it's like oh yeah i'm gonna play this villain here and everything and you listen to it back and you're like what the fuck am yeah, i thinking that's, that sounded a lot better in my head yeah next time <laughs> i'll just go bing bong and, right <laughs> well that, that's awesome man um what's uh where are you guys at are you looking at doing original music do you do original music now is it mostly covers where yeah so it we started i mean people were like billing us as a bluesy cover band right and, um <laughs> But, you know, we really wanted to do originals, and um, Andrew is just constantly writing. That's awesome. Constantly writing, really, and, yeah. you know, it makes me, like, I want to sit down and, like, actually try it myself. But he's just been, like, for years and years, just writing and writing and writing, whether it's, like, an R.L. Burnside-type flavor yeah. or whether it's, you know, more like a, a, a Black Keys-type flavor. He He's very influenced by... Black Keys, Jack White, Jimi Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan. And so a lot of that stuff kind of comes out in this like 
nouveau gritty like like he recorded an album in a bathroom because of the sound of like you know <laughs> that kind of shit oh yeah and, but it's also very like everything has parts right so but he's also really used to playing by himself so one of the biggest challenges that we had in the beginning was you know he'd play the rhythm and then he'd then he'd go to the lick and go back to the rhythm and so we would we would go to Phil at the same time. Right. It just sounded ridiculous. And so I'd be like, dude, either I'm going to fill or you're going to fill. <laughs> like, yeah. And so we've been working on that. But um, he's just constantly coming up with ideas and we're just trying to create around them. But it, even some of the, 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 the licks on the originals, he's, he's even coming up with, with a, a lot of my parts, which right. has been a really good learning experience. Uh, but the more and more we do it, the more I've – it's taught me how to think in that manner. Yeah, totally. But at this point, um, really long, drawn-out answer to your question. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> no, good. No, it's man. good. We like it. Yeah. We, we've got uh, seven originals completed. Nice. And we've got two more that are almost done. And so we are not going to play any more shows for at least four or five months um, as the band has insisted, we're a little split on it. Half of us are like, oh, let's do it all. The other half are like, we're incapable of doing both simultaneously. <laughs> let's write and finish. And um, So we've agreed to record uh, at the end of April, beginning nice. of May. Right on. We're going to finish these two and kind of release a, a nine-song EP. Nice. And, and, um, and then we'll, we'll do a, like an album release party sometime over the summer. Sweet. So yeah, we've got seven originals, and so our shows now are about half and half, half gotcha. covers and half originals. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean that's that's you know the obviously there's always those shows like you had mentioned Maxwell's the Cigar Bar. You know if you're playing for three hours, you got to do covers. There's just no way around it. But yeah, any any time you can draw a crowd in with a cover and then throw one of your songs at them to where they're going, well, what's whose song was that? And you can yeah. be like, it's ours. You know that's. It's like the rope a dope with 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 guys, and that's 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 really cool. I'm glad to hear that. I was gonna, I was hoping, I was hoping that would be your answer. I was anxious to hear y'all's y'all's original music. That's really cool. That's yeah, great. yeah. We got played. We debuted a new, a brand new one that had not been debuted um, on Friday, and then we played six or five of our other six originals. Cool. Um, one of them we just decided didn't make sense for the night. Gotcha. Yeah. Right for, on, man. For a uh, behind-the-scenes type of thing, a lot of times um, people think that you know they, we make all this money and we're supporting ourselves and all. You know, tell them. I'm sure most of us still all have day jobs and stuff. I mean, what is that? What you, you guys all still working day jobs and then you're trying to write in the evenings and stuff? Or oh yeah, I, I'm a I recruit software engineers for right for clients around the country. My uh, Andrew uh, works in the Yamaha manufacturing plant. Alex, the drummer, works in data science, and uh, yeah. Jason. Yeah. The bassist, That's... Uh, yeah, Jason, the bassist is uh, is an editor and writer for like a publication. That's where Which... we're hobbyist musicians yeah. that yeah. don't make sure we we are making money to right. serve the people that do this for full, full time. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. why. I, <clears throat> excuse me, why I asked the question. <clears throat> it's just so. People got an idea of what you're doing during the day and everything, because <clears throat> it's like it's you got to work a full time job. Yeah. We've got bills to pay, just of everything else, and then we're doing all this on yeah. Excel just to try to turn over so we can do more of what we do, what we love to do. Yeah, it's it's amazing how often I'll get from people like, "Wait, you have a day job? I'm like, yeah, yeah I've yeah. got kids, exactly. man. <laughs> like, you people need to tip me a lot more right. if you, if I can quit my day job. Yeah. <laughs> oh hell yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, do eat. We we felt like we raked the other night. Yeah, each of us walked away with three hundred bucks. That's uh, great that's money. Really no, that's good. phenomenal money. <laughs> yeah, well, I know it's really good. Yeah. It's the most we've yeah. ever made. Yeah, no, that's really that's close. fantastic. Like, think about that. I'm like, man, three hundred dollars for one day in one show for yeah. one week. Like, I how how I I yeah, I'd have to be doing five of those a week. Yep. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. when you start doing yeah. that math. It's like, well, if we could book that Tuesday through Saturday yeah. every week, we right. could make a go at this. Yeah. It's... Yeah. And, but then that's the thing. We're trying not to like, we're trying not to be the band that plays every weekend. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Because it's not, 
I, we just don't feel like it serves our fan base really well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If they're buying tickets to come out, the show should be special. That's yeah. that's absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Very cool. Well, let's talk nerdy gear shit. What uh, what what guitar and amp combo are you using right now? So I use a uh, a Gibson ES three thirty nine semi hollow body. It's like the three thirty five, just a little bit smaller. That's my primary guitar. I also have a uh, a custom Warmoth that has some fendery uh some fendery vibes to it yeah um and i actually bought that from paul provosti who is or was the guitarist from ear funk right on um just one of my favorite guitarists on the face of the planet and i've actually been doing some lessons with him um i bought that from him and so but i really have just i've really been playing the gibson yeah and um i run it through an orange rocker 30 um, I've also got a, um, I've also got a Fender Deluxe, but I, I keep going back to this, uh, to this, to this, to this orange. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Which anybody that's listening on the live record that we've got coming out on the cover side, Max is on a couple of the songs right. and you can hear that orange is a killer ant, man. I was really impressed with the tone of it at Maxwell's the other night. It's, they make a good product orange. They do. They do. And you know, tone, I'm still an idiot. To tone and that's another <laughs> thing that andrew has been helping me with a ton he's yeah. like he, he he's talked he's told me he's like you know some people dream about playing like i've had dreams about just turning knobs man like just turning <laughs> knobs. Press psycho. Press psycho. but he like i'll be like why is my tone doing this he'll be like hold on and they'll grab the pedals and they'll go to each one turn each knob and i'll play it i'm like Dude, that's what I've been trying to get my whole life. <laughs> I didn't know I had that sound in there. Oh my god, yeah. So part of it is is because of his fucking wizardry. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great, man. Very cool. What uh, I, I've been asking every guitar player that comes on this question, and Barry kind of knocked it out of the park yesterday. But what I'll tell you his answer after you tell us yours. What was your first guitar? Uh, first electric. Do you remember what the make and model was? Oh my god. Um, it was a washburn. Nice. It was black washburn, like a hundred and fifty dollars. Oh yeah. Or with like, I think, and I got like the starter. It was like a a Randall, ten watt, nice solid state amp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that was, that was my first one. But the first one that like, I really took with me and like helped me fall in love, and that I still have. It's in horrible shape. But it's such a cool looking guitar. Is um, it's this like maroon Schecter Diamond series. Oh, nice! Those are killer guitars. Yeah, yeah. And I, but you know, I was a, I mean, I was you know, one just getting so high as a teenager. I was leaving it in the cold car. Of the course, car. yeah, thinking it was cool to drop it and throw it against walls and shit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I'd be really, I'm like really scared to like take it to a tech and be like, what's going on in there. Uh, <laughs> It's not but a guitar yeah, was, anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, but but the Washburn. Yeah, yeah. That was, I haven't even thought about that. I'm surprised I even remember that. Well done. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you Barry's answer because it 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 floored me last night when he we I asked him that question. Of course, it's Barry Richmond. You know his collection's pretty pretty impressive. But his first was a 1964 Gibson ES125 with <laughs> with a brown face pre CBS uh, baseman. <laughs> Dude, I would sacrifice my left nut just to stare at something right? like that today. <laughs> today. Yeah. Yeah, he used to tell us I was like, oh Jesus. Like <laughs> that's I'm embarrassed to even say mine after that. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, right on, man. Well, uh if people want to find out more information about the band, where's what's the base place for them to find you? For right now it's to find us on Facebook. Okay. Uh, I think you got that link the night yep. holler. Yep, and I it'll be it. up on the on our website and on Facebook and Instagram and all that. Yeah, we're 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 slacking. Like we just got an Instagram. We have no merch. We've got some shitty YouTube videos that don't really do us justice. Um, <laughs> which is part of why, like, we reach out to other venues and we're like, "Hey, we sell this place out all the time." They're like, "Can you send us some recorded material?" And we're like, <laughs> "We'd rather well, not." <laughs> yeah. <please." laughs> so hopefully. In six months, if you're listening to this, it's like five, six months after this is recorded, yeah. I'm going to say, 
Go find us on Spotify. There you go. That yeah. was my next question. So is that the plan once you guys get the EP done, put it out digitally, all the all the usual venues? Yeah, and but I think we're probably going to do it in a manner where we le- release one song a month. That's smart. For like, yeah, that's or modern one ways, song yeah. uh, like every two weeks. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. four months, and then at the end, we'll release the whole album with the last three songs, and then announce our album release party. Totally, that's the way to do it nowadays, man. The the days Singles, of having yeah. to have like release day, drop a it's whole a, album. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot cooler. Give them give them songs and keep them going. You know, they once they've had a chance to listen to that song three or four times over a week or two, drop the next song, and yeah, stretch that out as much as you can. That's that's definitely the way to do it these days. Drew was the one who insisted. Yeah, I had he, like, he's like, dude, it's not like back in the day where you can just spin a cd over and over again right yep and you know burn it to the ground like you, you release the whole album they're they're you know they listen to it after a couple of weeks they're like all right what's next exactly yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's just everybody's such a consumer of media now whatever you can do to prolong that that was uh my the issue i'm running into now is i haven't put anything out since 2015 so that was why we did this live recording saturday night was just to have content out there because <laughs> it's yeah. oh so you were you recorded and released that show i haven't released it yet but we're going to yeah. so yeah oh, I'll, I'll, the, one that, the one that i came in and sat on yeah for a couple yeah yeah so yeah. i've got i've got your tracks on it too yeah that I'll, wasn't my, that wasn't my worst live performance ever no it was good man i've already gone through and level mixed everything so the plan that we're doing with that is we've got seven originals that we did that night that we're going to put out as just an original live ep and then we're going to do a fan appreciation disc or not disc, but digital disc of covers, you know, since obviously we can't sell them. They're not our songs, but put it out for free. Let everybody as, as my way of saying my fucking bad for taking so long to get this record done you know, and, and just kind of put it out as like a free download when they get the, the live, the, uh, the original EP. So that's that cover is going to go viral, though. I'm telling you, man, I'm hoping, man, something's got to. They love that. They're shit. they're a big fan. I would, so I'm like, dude, that's a really neat spin on it. It's fun. Yeah, it's just because I'm fat and hairy. That's that's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, it's been supposed to look like Britney Spears just a little bit. Just a little. It's a sparkle in my eye that I have. That's. <laughs> Got any crazy uh, stories from a gig yet? Um, crazy. I mean, it depends on you. you Funny, you know, whatever. I, yeah. It's all new. It's all new to me, but it's funny. Like something happens at every gig. Oh yeah, yeah. And and I, I guess I think the weirdest. Uh, again, you'll probably cut this one out. But like, <laughs> nah. As far as wildest one was like, I'm sure like for every famous rock star, this probably gets presented to them after every show. But for me, I had never experienced anything like this. But I was sitting there at Maxwell's after our like second or third show there and I'm counting cash and this girl um, just sits down next to me and uh, nibbles on my ear and then <laughs> just basically whispers and she says, I'm going to give you porn star head tonight. <laughs> and, and I look at her, I'm like, um, oh, well, you have my attention. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you had me <laughs> at hello. <laughs> I was like, well, um, so I'm, I'm counting the tips and I've got all this gear right. uh, that I've got to, uh, you know, I got I to gotta take that out. <laughs> she's, like, oh, she, she's, a little, she's a little drunk. She's like, oh, let me help you. I'm like, you're not, you're not touching our gear. <laughs> I was like, look, if you're really like dead set on this whole thing, we could just walk back out behind Maxwell's and figure it out. There's a nice dark alley back there. <laughs> filthy, dude. It is a filthy, <laughs> dirty, it's, it was raining. Oh, it's disgusting. So it was this wet dirty alley like right in between the the back of the bar with all the trash cans and the uh um the storage units nice and this girl just classy um yeah just just on on the wet asphalt and just domes me up right in the back alley and john walks out with the trash and i'm like don't come out here don't come out here. i'm sorry i'm sorry he's been cool about because he's never spoken about it again nice. and then i stumble back into the uh I stumble back in and with this girl and like, you know, into the light and the band is there just uh, setting up and uh, or, or cleaning up and they just stare at me. She looks at them. I'm, they won't be able to hear this, but she just looks at my band and goes like this <laughs> <laughs> and walks out the front door. 
Um, nice. So I don't know. I guess that was kind of like. Man, that is a very different experience than I have had at Maxwell's. Know, I'm trying to think. I've never had get, that experience like that. I just get the old drunk guys of like, man, you're the best guitar player I've ever heard. Yes. Like, what's your wife look like? Like, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was. I thought that was kind of neat. I think the other thing that was really funny that happened was at Smith's, and I'm gonna have to share this with my friend Emily just because she's getting featured. But um, <laughs> you know, we um. She was. She loves uh, art the way we do Valerie. Yeah. And so she's always requesting it, and she mentioned it. You know, I put out this whole fake set list. I saw. It was hilarious, by the way. Yeah. Nothing but, like, 50 minutes of smooth. Right, um, and tub thumping. And tub thumping yeah, and, 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 <laughs> an entire Britney Spears album in the key of D sharp, yep. right? Um, and, but, you know, she was like, I know it's a joke. I want you to play Valerie. She's getting drunk, and, you know, we're halfway into our show, and she's like, I mean, again, there's a hundred and something people in the audience. She's trying to get my attention and she's going like this. She's holding up two, and she's like angrily trying to tell me something. I was like, baby, I can't hear you. And in the middle, after that song, she like makes her way to the front of the crowd and comes to the stage and she's trying to yell something to me. I'm like, girl, what are you doing? And she comes up closer and she goes, I said, play Valerie. And she was holding up this. Uh, the V. <laughs> now, Tim, if this wasn't something that I had planned on playing, because, again, it wasn't like a take request Maxwell right. type of game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have been like, hey, shut up. I'm going to play whatever you want. Right. But, but I looked at her and I go, baby, we already played Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, I saw her standing there in the audience. I was like, and I literally I felt bad in front of the whole crowd. I was like, we already played it. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> and everyone started laughing. She just looked at me like, oh, shit. And then she took you back in the alley and gave you head. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. She and I don't blur that, blur that line. That's for the best, probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. You, uh, Emily is now famous. I uh, know. <laughs> should write a song about her. That's right. Horrific, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right on, man. Well, we won't take up any more of your time, dude. Thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with us. You got uh, any uh, upcoming gigs or something you want to yeah, talk about? Yeah, anything you want to promote? Any? Uh, obviously, you guys are working on working on the record, so. Yeah, so us as a band, we're, we're not going to do anything, but I'm going to take some suggestions from you and yeah. from Truett. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just going to start showing up to some stuff around town. And yeah, man my comfort zone get up there and fuck shit up hell yeah so, dude show your yeah, face everywhere you can get get out there and i mean that's that's the way you network and meet people become a better player yeah. get your ass kicked by guys way better than you that's what yeah, i've always done <laughs> i'm probably gonna check out that rusty barrel thursday night jam and you know you know piss my pants trying to hang with barry richmond or something he's oh. he's the most he's the most generous player you'll ever play with i uh when I was down, I didn't come back up to Pennsylvania until Tuesday last week. So Monday night, I went out to Dixie Tavern, the 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 jam that he hosts out there. And anytime now that because I'm living out of state, I'm lucky enough to get to play with him. Like if I go to one of his jams now, and we played four or five songs, and it's just he's so fucking good, and he's so generous, and just the sweetest guy you've ever met, and he never has a negative word to say, you he's know. Such- guy he is and he, then he'll play something and you're sitting there like what the fuck are the rest of us doing <laughs> like if that's guitar playing what are the rest of us doing <laughs> yeah dude for sure that's i remember the first the first like pickup gig or what even a pickup gig i filled in for jeff uh, his singer had another gig so joel had been playing with me for a while so he recommended me and i got to go to say I got to sing with the Barry Richmond band was pretty freaking cool. And I, I, I messaged Barry. I'm like, hey, dude, I know Jeff doesn't play anything. Should I bring a guitar? You know, I don't want to be rude. You know, this is this is your, your deal. He's like, no, yeah, of course, bring a guitar. So I'm like, all right, I'm bringing my A game. And, you know, I bring my, my rig that I always use out that I think has a pretty good tone. And we play the first song and Barry plays and then nods me a solo. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm probably just gonna play rhythm. <laughs> like you just, you, I don't necessarily want everybody to hear my sound now. You just, you just go ahead and keep oh, going. I'll finish with this though. Um, it's so it was so fascinating and so much fun playing with Joel. Oh my god! Yeah, playing with uh, not like oh like a good enough keyboarder, but like a really incredible on the keys. Yeah, um, playing with a really dope key a keyboard player. Like made it twice as fun. Yeah, yeah. Joel's 
the best thing that's ever happened to me musically was Joel getting to getting to be get to be good friends with him and co-write with him and just absorb his genius because he's a genius like I haven't met a lot of musicians that are geniuses you know and he is that story the stories you always hear about John Lennon and you know the, those types of guys you see it like he hears fucking everything you know you can quote two notes from something and he's like oh yeah let's play that whole song now <laughs> it's just, just it's listening through those recordings from Maxwell's you know in Voodoo Child in the 12 minutes that we played Voodoo Child we played seven songs and it was all me quoting something and then Joel doing it or Joel quoting something. And there's so much to be said for playing with guys. I love that, like, in that band, I am the least talented person. You know, like, getting to play with, with Joel and Charlie, it's just like, holy balls. Like, I'm just, like, lassoing up and holding on, basically. <laughs> that's Those yeah. are the, that's how I felt this past weekend. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I know about my band. I am for sure the least talented yeah member of that. and that's that's the only way you get better you know you, you never want to be the best guy in a room and that's that's uh, surrounding yourself with players like that's the best thing you can do for yourself you know that's and and when i get a compliment from a guy like joel or you know something like that it, it means so much you know and it's like man i really dig what you were doing there like oh cool thanks you know it's, <laughs> you're like a like a 12 year old <laughs> it's and then he takes me out in the alley and blows me. So, <laughs> <laughs> people for playing a good show. That's right. Yeah, yeah. it's just a polite, nice, a good neighborly <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> right. We've definitely broken into the uh, explicit category. Yeah. Here. No, we're hundred percent. <laughs> iTunes has already flagged us explicit, so right we're okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yep. Well, all right. Well, dude, thank you so much, man. Yeah, man. And um, yeah, we'll have all the links and stuff up. But everyone, Max Levitan. Thanks, Thanks bud. guys. Have a good night. One last run to the unknown